Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Saints of God, holy and dearly loved, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation this sixth Sunday after Trinity is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Here ends our reading. In the 22nd chapter of the book of 1 Kings in the Old Testament, we read an account in which Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, draws near to Ahab, king of Israel. He wanted to establish uh, an agreement, a, a peace treaty. Ahab said, let's work together to gather, to take back the land of Ramoth and Gilead that Syria had taken from Israel, his land. Jehoshaphat accepted. And he said that they should consult the prophets of the Lord to get what the word of God says before beginning this endeavor. Ahab gathered his prophets, who said unanimously, Go, and the Lord will deliver into your hands the land. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, asked, isn't there a prophet of the Lord that they could consult? Because Ahab had persecuted the prophets of the Lord, he told him, there remains only one man that, we can, con that can consult the Lord. But I hate him because he only ever prophesies poorly, evilly, about me. He never says anything good. It's Micaiah, son of Jimla. Ahab didn't listen to Micaiah because he was a faithful prophet of the Lord who was speaking the truth to him. What about you? Who are you listening to? Who are you putting your trust in? The problem, your problem and my problem, is that we're not always good judges. That we aren't always able to distinguish who is trustworthy and who is not. We have prejudices so that we favor some and don't listen to others. Recently, there were some journalists in the States who admitted that they didn't even look into the possibility that the source of the Wuhan, of the coronavirus could have been the Institute of Virology in Wuhan. Why? Because they didn't like President Trump, and he was the one saying that this is a possibility. No, no, it started in the wet market. Too often, we don't listen to people that we don't like to listen to. And... We just accept things without having done our own research, without drawing our own proper conclusion. We don't consider other people's points of view, and we don't want other people to make fun of us. So 
the temptation is just to accept the most popular opinions. We give privilege to the opinions that we like, and we just don't pay attention. We minimize, we ignore the opinions of those who say what we don't want to hear. But it's not just enough to try and listen to other people's opinions to figure out what is the truth. Rather, we are called to recognize the truth of God. You see, that was what was missing for Ahab. He didn't like Micaiah. And so he didn't consult him. But when the prophet warned him that he was going to die on the battlefield, what did he do? Did he heed the warning? No, he decided to ignore it. He was going to go to the battlefield in disguise. And both kings, Jehoshaphat and Ahab, died on the battlefield. It's not just that they ignored Micaiah, though. Rather, it was that they ignored the word of God. You see, that's the problem that we see in the gospel lesson that was read this morning. Jesus leaves Jairus' house and goes with his disciples into Nazareth, where he grew up. On the Sabbath day, they all went to synagogue. And it's not that Jesus stood up and asked to speak. The ruler of the synagogue, recognizing Jesus was a rabbi, invited him to participate in the proceedings of the worship. Now, according to Alfred Eidersheim, uh, a Jewish person who converted and became a Christian and explained a lot of Jewish practices, it was often the practice to invite rabbis like Jesus so that the synagogue would be full on the Sabbath day. Jesus, therefore, got up to the lectern, and the church service started. There would have been two prayers and the Jewish creed, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then after another prayer, there would have been 18 blessings of praise for the Lord, and that would have been followed by yet other prayers uh, appropriate to the day and what was going on in the world. And then if there were any priests present, they would raise their hands in blessing for the people, and if they weren't there, then it would fall to the, the head of the synagogue to bless the assembly. And then there was one final prayer to end the liturgy. Then after the liturgy, the texts would be brought out, the scrolls. And the texts for the day would be read in Hebrew. And because at that time most people didn't understand Hebrew, they would have been translated into Aramean. Uh, into Aramaic. Now, usually after the reading of the prophet, there was the sermon. And so it is that Jesus, after having read the text, sat down. That was the way they, the, the, the leaders preached. And he began his sermon, surrounded by those who knew him from his childhood, and I'm sure others that had heard of him and showed up to synagogue that day. At the end of the discourse, people could ask him questions or oppose him. And then finally, after a final prayer, people would go home after synagogue. How did the people respond? They were shocked. Mark lists a whole series of questions that they were asking. Where does he get this? This, this wisdom, how has it been given to him? And how can his hands do these miracles? Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Jude and Simon? And are not his sisters among us? The first question, where does he get this from? It might actually be a repetition of a question asked earlier in Mark's gospel. It might be an accusation like the religious leaders asked. Is Jesus casting out demons by Satan? And we know that Jesus refuted that by saying, if Satan fights against Satan, 
his house is divided and he will not stand. The second question was, where does he get this wisdom from? By this question, people knew that Jesus had attended the same synagogue that they did week after week. They had attended the schooling at the synagogue to learn God's word. They recognized that Jesus had a knowledge of the word of God that went above what was taught at the synagogue at the local level. And yet, he hadn't followed any other important rabbi. He hadn't had any particular training. Where did this come from, this wisdom? And then the third question seems reasonable. How can his hands do such miracles? The, rep- the, the answer should have been evident. Even if they didn't believe he was the Messiah, they should recognize that he could only be accomplishing th- these things by the power of God. But the next question showed that they were rejecting Jesus. Is he not the carpenter? Justin Martyr, towards the end of the first century, writes that Jesus and Joseph were known for their plows and for their yoke that they built. Moreover, the Greek word that is translated as carpenter is the word tecton. The tecton was a worker who worked in construction, either with wood or with tiles, going so far as to making mosaics. It was a job that was not highly respected. Usually, carpenters were itinerant workers. They didn't just stay in their homeland and where they're from, but they moved around where there were construction jobs to be had. You can't expect there to be a whole lot of tile work done in sleepy little Nazareth, this village there. But Nazareth was only five kilometers from Sepphoris, the Roman capital in Galilee. Sepphoris had been destroyed in the year 4 BC, and Herod Antipas had the city rebuilt. At the same time that Jesus was growing up in Nazareth. So maybe Joseph and Jesus were among the carpenters who played a role in the reconstruction of Sepphoris. Maybe not. What we can know, though, is that he was working with his hands. And in the same way that you don't call a plumber when a woman is about to go into labor, you don't call the carpenter to preach on Sunday morning normally. You don't expect him to be able to do miracles. The people from Nazareth decided not to listen to Jesus because according to them, he's just the carpenter. The people asked, isn't he just the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Jude and Simon, and are not his sisters among us? By saying he was the son of Mary, they might be giving a hint that they doubted that Joseph was really his father. And in the same way that Ahab, as I talked about earlier in the sermon, rejected Micaiah the prophet, these people rejected Jesus, including his extended family and Mary and the brothers and sisters of Jesus all seem to be unbelieving. And so it is that Jesus says to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Since Mary and his brothers and sisters had already sought to bring Jesus home when he was starting his ministry, it's reasonable to say that they didn't believe in him. And so it's logical to say that neither did the rest of the town. That's the danger for you. Are you going to put your confidence in the word of God or not? The gospel reading says Jesus could do do no miracle there, 
and that he could heal none except a few sick by putting his hands on them. The problem wasn't that Jesus wasn't able to do miracles or to heal the sick. It wasn't that there was a lack of faith in the people as if it was their faith that empowered Jesus to do these miracles. No. It's that these people didn't trust Jesus, and so they didn't come to him asking to be healed. Rather than accepting the word of God that was right there in their presence, rather than accepting what they had heard him preach in the synagogue, no. Not really a rabbi. Not really a prophet. They didn't pay any attention to what Jesus could do. And they didn't listen to him. They were unbelieving and wouldn't draw near to Jesus. If you don't put your trust in Jesus and in the word of God, in who are you going to put your trust? In yourself? In your family? In the government? In scientists and what they can produce? In technology? In the experts? In, in things that are written in books? In journalists? And the people talking heads on TV that report the news? In pastors and priests and other Christians? They're not always wrong, but when you trust these people, you will be disappointed. You are called to put your trust in Jesus and in his word. Even if you don't like what he's saying to you and you want to reject him, don't. Don't despise him. Don't be unbelieving. Why? Because he is faithful. He will not abandon you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds steadfast in Jesus Christ until life everlasting. Amen.